everybody, and welcome to a correctional Wild Ride with Steve-O. This episode is killer. We've got James Allen Jr., who was on death row for years, three years. Then he got his sentence commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Then he got that sentence commuted to life with the possibility of parole. So he can speak to what it was like to be on death row, what it was like to be in regular prison, general population, and what it's like to be to be free. I mean, this is the wildest of wild rides, man. Wow, is this epic. Let's get into it. If, uh, if you want any of that. <laughs> we bought it. We were like, "Whoa, fuck! Why did we do that?" Already, wait a minute. I got more lives than a cat, so why would I do liquid death? <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, a company that I really believe in. I'm an ambassador of it. Okay. The idea is death to plastic. And, and it, it's, is it actually water? It's still water from the Mine Alps. Water. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, former death row inmate, James Allen Jr. Mm -hmm. Good to meet you. You too, Steve-O. <laughs> All right. So this is interesting. And it came about when I recently went on quite a rant about the death penalty, how it's uh incredibly expensive with all the appeals that you got to go through to execute somebody by the time you've executed a prisoner you've spent I, I thought it was 10 times the amount that it would cost to keep them alive for the rest of their natural life but i've learned it's more like two to three times still making it pretty dumb and uh, I've got all kinds of thoughts about the death penalty just being stupid. And we threw out the idea, wouldn't it be cool to interview a death row inmate? And we got all kinds of responses. And somebody said, what do you think about a guy who was on death row, then got his, well, you, you, you tell us. What's the, the, your, your career with uh, correctional facilities? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just say I'm... Um, uh ecstatic being here today and it's good to meet the famous steve-o well thank <laughs> the, uh, you jackass <laughs> so um you know mine is a unique experience um growing up here in nevada in in las vegas um in one of the poorest areas of, of, the, of the town and you know i had a father and a mother but uh like most marriages theirs didn't last so now i'm stuck with a single mother and she's trying to raise two boys that are <laughs> gun ho you know so uh she was a christian and she drug us to church and made us sing in the choir and you know uh, my mother was a singer and uh, she's still living um she's um she's a big part of the reason why i'm uh, i'm here today and my freedom exists um my mom is a pioneer she uh struggled in the 70s and she also did a little time for murder so you can see where her son grows up and end up on death row for murder so but hers were was a case of um, domestic violence and she ended up with a second degree type murder okay. deal and she did a little probation but anyway um Growing up here on the streets of Las Vegas, wow. You know, I can remember the eras of the Molon Rouge, me as a little 12, 13-year-old kid, trying to get up in there. <laughs> Did you find so. yourself in jail or prison before the murder? Well, you know, I was my juvenile life was um, pretty normal. You know, fights here and there, curfew. She would have to come down and get me. But as I got older and... Uh, my fascination with guns and, you know, being associated with gangs and of that nature and, you know, the pimps and the hustlers, these are my type of people, man, you know, so. And that's right, you, the, the murder was when you were 17? Yes. Um, I was pretty good at what they call catwalking. I had an older guy, older OG a uh, guy from the neighborhood, and he was pretty good at what he does. And okay, I don't know what catwalking is. Well, catwalking is like, um, you're knocking on, you, you go into a strange neighborhood, and it's not a burglary, because you're hoping to catch someone there so you can do the robbery and the burglary. 
You know, it's like a two, two in one catch. You know, so that so, sounds more like a home invasion. Yes, that's okay, they call good. it a home invasion now. Yes, that's what they're. That's like. a that's a serious yes. crime. Mm-hmm. And back well back then, they looked at it as a real serious crime. And like I said, I was the I was the first one to receive the death sentence when that law came in effect in Nevada. Okay, yeah, so, so 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 your your murder happened during a home invasion. Is that yes? Yes, it was a home invasion. Uh, me and the older guy, um, we went and I was strapped with a gun. And uh, the homeowner was there. And he suddenly woke up and he heard noise. He grabbed his gun. And when he came around the corner with his gun, I didn't give him a chance. You know, right. I fired. And uh, I fired two shots. And lo and behold, in the darkness, I mean, pure black darkness, this guy got hit right between the eyes. Oof. And, you know, that didn't hit me until later on in, you know, my adult year as a, as a kid. You know, that didn't really ring out to me how uh, one shot could take a person's life when, you know, I just really just shot, you know. So, but anyway, yeah, that landed me a first degree murder uh, with burglary. And right. I got to believe that with the home invasion happening uh, at the time, that that's even an aggravated first degree murder, if that if that's a thing. Yeah. Well, they never they never put anything on the table but capital offense. Right. Open murder. So it was either going to be life without or the death penalty. Right. OK. Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested because I pay attention to a lot of true crime stuff. And I, I see all the time that murderers will do anything to avoid the death penalty. They'll mm-hmm. take that plea bargain mm-hmm. just so to get death penalty off the table. Right. Was that an option for you at the time? Well, I had a couple, um, a couple of crafty attorneys, and they were state appointed attorneys. So they kind of laid the law down. You're young. This DA is really seeking this death sentence you know he's pushing to be governor one day and lo and behold the guy becomes governor but anyway um it's like uh he said you're either gonna accept the rest of your life in prison or this state is gonna try and execute you and he goes executing you they may not do It's, it's 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 very expensive james and this is a tourism type of town and they don't want to be known for executing a teenager or a youngster you know wow so he goes uh i'm gonna fight like hell but um it's on the table life without and my mom by her doing time before she's no even though i know my son did this but no not life without in prison so we'll take our chances in trial got it and that's how i ended up in trial and I went in front of a, a, like a senior citizen jury, you know. I'm looking like all of these old people are my my peers, you know. <laughs> and it was, you know, uh, it was so um, dramatic in the courtroom, uh, shouting, crying, you know, uh, the victim's family over here, and you got their side of it, and I, I'm understanding that, you know. Uh, then you got my side of the family, and. I mean, my mom was a soldier. She, she walked around that county jail at night. After she come and visit me, she would literally walk around the county jail and get people to walk with her, you know, to free James Allen. They're gonna wow. give my son a death sentence. Yeah. So when you went to trial, were you, uh, did you plead not guilty and you were trying to get acquitted? Well, I'll tell you what, I was interrogated for like 16, almost 17 hours by two, de- two detectives because they really wanted my co-defendant. You know, he was the bigger fish. The you older know, even guy. Even though uh, I'm, you know, uh, I'm facing charges of, of murder, but they wanted him. They've been looking for this, you know, this guy's a seasonal vet, he's a career criminal. You know, he's, he's stung for big money in this town. And so we all kind of looked up to this guy as being the OG of the neighborhood, you know. So uh, they interrogated me like, Six, 16 hours and they're, they're constantly telling me you're going to get the death penalty man you better we know this guy's your co-defendant you know we know he's and I wouldn't give him up you know I wouldn't give them a name code of but, the streets huh but I tell you what they, they got my mom on the phone yes the code of the streets oh you don't tell 
you know, snitch, snitches get <laughs> snitches. But uh, so they call my mom and she's on the phone and it's like a conference call. And she goes, well, I'll tell you what, uh, I know my son is guilty, but he's not guilty as the guy you guys are looking for. See, mom is trying to sway it. You know, she's really trying to get this. She knows what's ahead of me. And so I make a confession. Yeah, I was there. I uh, orchestrated the whole plot. You know, uh, I chose the house. Uh, I knew you the shot the gun. Yeah, yeah. I did the fatal shot. Yeah, everything. And the detectives go, they weren't happy with that. You know, they wanted the co-defendant. May he rest in peace. He's dead now. But, you know, I, I mean, I even talked about him in the book. But um, what an experience, man. And I tell you what. After all that I've been through, I understand the death penalty. Was it for guys like me, a young kid, you know, ambition, uh, ambition out the roof? Uh, just, Who is it for then? It's for the guy that gives up, that look at you, me, and everyone and say, I don't care about you. I don't care if you die today, and I don't care if it's by these hands. That's who it's for. Okay. Um, I mean, where do you put those type of people that think like that? They, I mean, is there such a thing as a verse on one psychology where you can really go in and a person's belief, you can change their belief in humanity? Uh, now, I'm not doubting or suggesting that there are not people who just should never be allowed into society ever again. And I also recognize that there's a problem with uh, life in prison, not meaning life in prison. I mean, here we're, we're, we're talking to the guy who was on death row, got his sentence commuted to life, and yeah. is now walking the streets. Well, you know what, Steve-O? I think I'm <laughs> the ultimate guinea pig. I was a test. You know, I literally grew up in prison. I did, evidently. I mean, so you know. at the trial, you, you, you pled not guilty after mm -hmm. they had this confession 16 hours. Yeah. So the trial probably didn't last too long. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. too much deliberating Maybe going five on. Five hours. Of <laughs> <laughs> five hours of a trial or five hours of deliberation? <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, it was. <laughs> hey, listen. The jail was ready to erupt because, you know, uh, I was in jail for over a year, you know, so and I'm before that before the, the conviction. Yes. OK, yeah. And so you're meeting all types of people, uh, you know, you're young and they had you in adult jail waiting for trial. Oh, yes. They yeah, had yeah. me down where it was like eight of us in a secured area and we were all facing the death penalty. Some of these guys, one guy was his name was Billy. Hanson, and he was considered a serial killer. Real nice guy, though. And, <laughs> and he was the only guy who had a guitar that I ever seen with a hollow guitar in, 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 in jail. But they catered to this guy, and you know, and he was he had a real charming personality. Okay. Did he get the death penalty? No. The serial um, killer did not get Joe, the death penalty. Joe Coza, another one. He killed the uh, taxi driver and the um, the passenger. Did he get the death penalty? No. These guys, I was the only one, Tony, I can just name guys whose trial was lined up right, just right after mine. And I was the only one to get the death penalty. Um, um, well, yeah. maybe those other guys took the plea to get the death penalty off the table. Maybe they no, didn't do the, no, the trial. No, they went to the trial. That's what okay. I was saying. Were, yeah, you know, you know, a couple of them got overflowed to another courtroom. and But uh, it was just uh, kind of different that I received the death sentence and I was the youngest one because right. a couple of these guys were career criminals. And I wonder if your not snitching had anything to do with that. You know, uh, I went for hard and I didn't, you know, I had some OGs to get to me early. They say, don't get all tatted up. Don't get a sleeve. They don't need, the, you know, it's going to be hard, dude. So one day you may have a chance of going home. They gave you life without. You may go home one day. Laws are changing, you know. So I kept myself kind of clean cut and, okay. through, you know, but um, 
back to that question with the guys on death row that deserve it. You know, when your neighbor is a dude that just killed a girl, you know, a little 12 year old girl, slit her throat. Yeah. You know, you know, discapitated her body and just burnt parts of her, you know, right. put her in a shallow grave. And, you know, this is my neighbor. So it was hard for me to come out during a wreck period on death row and not try to kill this guy. What's you know, a wreck? Oh, under a wreck period. Yeah, okay, you know, got it. Period. Right, 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 right. You know, and there was ways back in the day, death row wasn't very secure like it is up at Ely, Nevada. You know, right. Back in Carson City, the old death row. And I was allowed to go back there a uh, year ago. And I, it was well, scary. To, to they talk let to me the into the chamber. No, I went back on death. This prison is is closed, and the art society and the uh, Nevada Prison Society are getting ready to do a uh, tour. Like, so they invited me back, and I went through and took a cameraman, and finally went in the chamber. You know, this is supposed to be my. I got pictures in my phone. Wow. <laughs> can yes. I can I ask when they read the verdict? You know, death. Mm -hmm. w w what goes through your head? I mean, are you just so scared that you're blacking out and you're like... Well, I'll tell you what. Um, you know, as at a young age, I knew that I was different. You know, I wasn't no follower. You know, you couldn't convince me to do nothing at a young age. So when I took on a leadership role while I was in jail with the other youngsters you know uh every chance up in the law library talking to them and hey dude we destined for prison you know we going <laughs> we just don't know what our fate is but um when they read that verdict my mother i heard a wailing sound mm -hmm. it was my mom and i never heard her scream like that and it went through me and i looked around and these cameras was in the courtroom and you know i was the youngest to receive that death sentence at that time. And it was big news, you know. Uh, like I said, the True Magazine, the detectives, I was in all that series. But it hit me, um, it finally hit me when they chained me up. You know, it wasn't a regular, put your hands behind your back. Now it's my ankles, from my ankle to my waist, from my waist to here. Wow. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the back of this uh, Cessna plane by myself with uh, three other people, uh, two guards and a pilot. And they go, well, kid, you're in the safest part of the plane. And I've never been in a plane before, but I was mm. all the way back in the tail. And they said, well, this won't be your death sentence because if we go down, they're trying to build some humor in me or something, get me to laugh or <laughs> something, you know? But uh, at that moment, it hit me that the seriousness that, okay, I'm going to my uh, demise. This is it. The state is going to take care of uh, my death. You know. Um, Did you know how long it was going to happen in, or the time period? Well, the attorney was explaining to me. Uh, he said, um, "We get an automatic appeal, James. Uh, it's a shame that your first execution date is uh, uh, two days before your twentieth birthday." <laughs> yeah. And he said, uh, I go, wow, I won't make 21? <laughs> and he goes, well, yeah. you're going to get a stay of execution, and if that fails, then we're going to file to the governor, we're going to file to the Supreme Court, or the, you know, we're going to just, it's going to be delayed. You'll be an old man sitting up here. Right. Because Nevada is not going to do it. He said, but my goal is to get you off. You know, right. Let you live a life in prison. You know, I don't think they'll ever let you out, James. And that attorney... When he watched me come home after 28 years, he was standing there. Man, where would he be without that lawyer? And as a small business owner, where would I be without ShipStation? That's right, man. If you want to kill it in today's world, you got to have an e-commerce business going off. And if you're going to have that, then you have to have ShipStation because with every order, you need to ship it out. And ShipStation gives you discounted prices for like all of your different carriers. 
Hell, you get up to 88% off of USPS. That's the United States Postal Service and UPS. And if you want to get an even better deal, then go to ShipStation.com and use the promo code STEVO for two months of a free trial. I mean, you can't go wrong. <laughs> Plus, this is how we ship everything out of my Stevo online store. It's the savior for my business. Like James Allen Jr.'s lawyer, ShipStation is always on my side. And they can be on your side if you go to ShipStation.com and use the promo code Stevo. I bid you well to kill it with e-commerce. Now, let's get back to it. Wow. Old Frank Crimmin, attorney at law. He's still attorney. Yeah, I'm his biggest case, man. Uh, he's in the book. And the book is called Not My, Not My Chair. Chair. That I picked Not My Chair because at that time in the chamber, it's two chairs. And, you know, it's gas. You know, oh. like, by lethal injection at that time. You know, they had a bucket under the chair and they had the pellet. It rolls down and it hits the gas. And, you know, wow. you're, gonna, you're gonna die off your, your vomit and your. So one of the chairs is missing. And I found out later where the chair is at. The chair is at the mob museum. When I came home from prison, they found out my story, gave me a job at the mob museum. Next to this chair, it's like being reunited wow. with my demise. Wait a minute. This is the chair that they were supposed to put. And it's at so, the mob museum. So I have so a picture of that too. It wasn't lethal injection. They were talking about gas. I, I, yes. I don't even think I've ever heard gas of a, chamber, yeah. a gas chamber execution. Did, did you, Nevada was one of the last states uh, that had that, that's, Nevada, Utah. Did that, you know what the gas entailed? Like, what, like, were you reading about it for the first time? Like, fuck, this is how I'm going to die? Yeah, you know, I was reading about capsules and acid and how to... But when do you read about that? Like, what, like you're on death row and then you're like, what, what, at what point do you, you're like, okay, well... I guess. Well, the guy that's up, coming up, which was uh, James Carroll, you know, I mean, it was real. Everybody was, when his time came up and he didn't want to even uh, finish the appeals, you know, he said, let it be. And uh, it was just a real eerie feeling just that whole month, you know, watching him, watch how he moved and, you know, his conversation became very short you know this was a, a very reliable you know uh uh inter interesting type of guy because he had a lot of stories to tell you know old gangster stories and so um when they was preparing him for the overnight sales well you know, overnight they sales. They, well i got they pulled a joke on me and it was like an initiation because you, you dealt with six officers all the time on death row. So when I got there, uh, I'll get back to the other story, but when I got there, uh, they ran, you know, they ran the, the, the gamut down to me. Hey, this is allowed, you're not gonna be able to do this. You're on death row, we're gonna respect you, you know, but this is our house, you know, and they had no problem coming in. You know, a few times they had to come in and let me know, you know, I was, I don't know, I was, being lonely and you know I'm in Carson City you know uh, never been around this much snow in the winter time and the cows are dumb they're standing out in the snow and I'm my windows facing this farm life and you know I'm just watching reality just leave every day reality leaves because this is all I have is these people you know up here right. and I made the 12th person at that time so uh, one of the Jesus freak up there he said well you're the 12th disciple Huh. <laughs> okay, let, let's break down the the time you spent on death row. I understand it was three and a half years. Yes. And then you got your sentence commuted to Locked life out. without parole. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in prison facing life without parole? 25 after, years. 25 years after the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So then 25 years and that, how to how does life without parole turn into your free well um i took the advice of a lot of smart people some of them have you know died and gone on and 
some are out and they're living productive lives, you know, but they gave me a lot of advice, man. Um, one thing was to never give up on your education, you know, and I did. I, once I got my GED and a little high school diploma and did the little graduation with the Clark County School District, uh, I took some college courses and tried to uh, at least come out with an associate, but I got disinterested. Once I got life with the possibility of parole, you know, uh, I got eager now. And I had to really look at myself and go, am I really for this world? Because it's like I was living a make-believe world in here. You know, now I'm going to be free as a man. How far into life without parole did it become life with the possibility of parole? Um, in 2003, the late governor, Kenny Gwynn, may he rest in peace, he looked at me and goes, you look tired. He goes, I'm, I'm not an ex-cop, I'm not an ex-judge, I'm not a lawmaker, I'm a businessman. And I think you'd be great. Wow. I think you'd be great one day in society. <clears throat> and you know who echoed that? The late senator, the late great senator, Harry Reid. I have a picture with Senator, he invited me to Washington. And he heard about my story and uh, he sat and talked with my mom. And he wrote letters and things uh, concerning my um, um, eligibility. Rehabilitation. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's a such word as habilitation. Habilitation means you knew something before the rehabilitation. Okay. If you didn't, if you don't know nothing before you rehabilitated, what are you, how are you being rehabilitated? All right. <laughs> so, so I had to learn things like that also, <clears throat> but. You know, uh, Steve-O, it's, it's been a great experience, man. Uh, when, I achieved a lot of accolades while I was in prison. Uh, I was a, a lot of firsts. I was the first to put a band together uh, coming off a of death row, and they didn't believe I could do it. But I grew up in this town, so I started reaching out to people, and I was always musically inclined, you know. So I reached out to several of the outlets, and they started sending me used drums used uh, guitars and bass and pianos so I asked the director if I find the inmates that can play these instruments will you allow us to have a band not only did they allow us to have a band we traveled from prison to prison wow, wow. <laughs> in this state <clears throat> it what, don't happen off of now. death row off of death row yeah, yeah that's yeah. not happening in death row right <laughs> I had wardens come in and they bring their guitar and sit in with the jam session. Wow. You know, it's just, I have so many firsts, man. You know, like I said, I'm so proud, even though my mom is in dementia and we take care of her, you know, that old lady is taking care of her real well. But uh, I wanted her to see the, this part because she didn't, she don't know about the bug. She didn't, you know, she don't know about me performing and going out talking to the youth and giving back like I do but uh, she was my biggest fan and sounds like it wow what a lady man what a lady when were you freed I was freed in 2008 I walked out 2008 yeah what, what was the first thing you did when you got freed I kissed the road right in front of the parole you know they, they drop you off in front of the uh, parole office parole and probation because you have to check in and get your ID and stuff. And uh, my mom was there, and uh, I didn't even hug her. I just got off the van, and they took the chains off, and I leaned down and kissed the ground. Did you feel free? Not at first. It, it felt like a bad move. Did hmm. uh, I mean, when I, you know, ex-convicts, you know, we have certain words that we use. When I say a bad move, um, you, they're, they're going to move you from one prison to the next. Maybe this prison is better, this prison yard. So it's a bad move, better bad move. And it's like, I know that I'm still under scrutiny and, and I'm up under a microscope and someone still has authority over me because I can't get visas, I can't leave the country. I, you know. <clears throat> right. Yeah, you, I understand that you have a lifetime supervision yes, while you're out. lifetime parole. So what, what does that mean? Well... For me, 
the laws change and I'm what you consider up under past laws and they still apply to me. I see so you got I grandfathered can, in on those. Yeah, <laughs> so I can still apply for a commutation of sentence or get my sentence commuted or I can even ask for a determined sentence. Like uh, I could go back to the district court and say, hey, can I go for a sentencing uh, modification? And that judge may turn around and say, yeah, I'll give you 10 years. Time, sir. Now I'm off parole and I can, you know, I don't have to seek no one to try and um, own a weapon or anything like that. And on that note, I don't care if I ever own a gun again. Right. Give me a bat. Someone come around my house, I'm going to give you an old-fashioned butt whooping. Yeah, I'm not going to kill you. Did you find it hard getting acclimated back into society? Yes, I did. Because um, back in 2008, that's like iPhones, computers, laptops. Yes, yes. Yeah, you went back to the future. They gave me a flip phone, and all it did was answer. My sister go, all you have to do is just open it up, and when you're done, close it. Wow. <laughs> and she said, that's it. Don't touch nothing, don't... <laughs> Wow! I, I didn't know any numbers. I didn't know how. I didn't know how to do anything. And thank God I wasn't around for um, the beepers and all that you guys went. Yeah, the beeper yeah. and what is the other one? Um, uh, Fax machine. Uh, <laughs> e email. Yeah, and all that. Uh, man, it's it's just you know the IT part of this. Sometimes I can wake up and it feels like I'm on Mars somewhere. Like, right? Look at this out here, man. And I'm, I'm you know, do I deserve this? You know, I beat myself up a lot because I understand uh, the value of human life. I understand humanity, man, and we all need each other. And no one has the right, no one has that right to take nobody's life. That's why I say when you get a criminally insane person that don't care, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. how do you know if somebody's like just faking that? Well, you know, well, Let's say in the criminal world, you know, when you got a bunch of convicts, guys that's on a prison yard, everybody's gonna find their group. The strong are gonna sit back and just look at everybody through the yard and go, he's an idiot, you know, he's gay, uh, he's mentally ill. And believe it or not, on that, on that type of uh, evaluation of people nine times out of ten they're right you know I mean I don't doubt that and I would take it a step further to say that I believe in that prison structure that life is a lot more equal to what our DNA is built for it to be like probably the the natural the primal like like early humans hmm. live by that code yeah. more than what's going on in this society that we have now. Yeah, I tell you what, this society better wake up soon, and the people they better listen to are the people that have done decades in, in prison a, behind a wall in a shoe program. You know, Pelican Bay, here, High Desert, Ely. You know, you bet if if these people make it back to the streets and they say, I want to serve, you better listen. Because I'm telling you, I was telling lawmakers, I go, this past summer, this summer coming, you're going to see a wave in these young kids, these high school kids. You know, I'm talking to football players, a good team. They're bringing guns to practice. So the coach says, James, can you come talk? Wow. You know, and I'm talking to this football team. <clears throat> you know, and these guys are seniors. And I go, you, you waited your whole life to get to the next level, the money round. And you're here playing games at a high school, you know, and, and it was just high school after high school. And now, you know, the news can't report it fast enough. You know, the carjackings are back, you know, the home invasions are back. And these kids are don't, they don't care. You know why? I watched the school district and I hate it happen here because I love Vegas. Vegas is my town, man. I mean, you know, um, the school district here, uh, I watched them graduate. Six high schools of seniors that are dumb as fuck. Hmm. You know why I know? 
because I'm their mentor. These are kids that they you send them to a behavior school. Okay, they do a couple of weeks. Now you put them back on a regular schoolyard. And uh, they're walking around. They got monitors, ankle monitors, because they're facing charges, whether it's down in juvenile or down in adult. You know, and I know these kids, but you're gonna give them a diploma. You're gonna let them do the pump and circumstance with a gown and a cap, and you're gonna give them a diploma when he he can't even tell you who the governor is. He can't even leave his mom mom house and go and balance a checkbook, fill out an application. <sighs> He's 18, and they're you know they're all together and they got their diplomas and they're taking pictures. I got it right in my phone. These these are graduations that I attended. And this is how America is. It's not just here, so I'm not just gonna pounce on this state. Or the, but this is how America is. And they're releasing these kids. And these kids don't give a damn about the jobs that our parents work, uh, the type of money is coming in. They got their own method of doing things, their own way. And we're lucky enough that they still respect guys like me. I can walk, it doesn't matter where I go, you know. Uh, I can walk in a room and they go, can you guess this guy for fashion? You know, quite natural. I was, I used to be big, real big. So they, well, oh no, he's a football player. He's a sports player. Oh, uh, he's a cop. Everything but a criminal. Everything but Why a guy that's that been on death row. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Everything <laughs> that's <laughs> professional <laughs> criminal. <laughs> you know, right? But I thought you were gonna say uh, a musician. Feel, it makes me feel good though, you know. Right. And, okay. Uh, just to be out here, and if I don't tell you. I've been on death row. Right. I'm just another black guy. Right. Walking, walking by. <laughs> let, let me ask you about the difference between being on death row and being in general population. Well, on death row, you're dealing with, you know, uh, a sec, select group of guys and everybody got the same sentence. So. A smaller number of guys. Yes. And the respect level is high, you know. I mean, this except guy, for you're trying to, you're thinking about killing the one guy, dude. I'm, dude, I'm telling you, it got so serious. One day at rec time, I went out to the pen, and it had just it had just snowed, right? So, uh, at Old Max in Carson City, the the construction crew back then or somebody, but there were nails this long, rusted nails, you know, and you you can tell you know it came out of an old concrete slab or something, but uh, it was left by a construction crew. So I got one and I, you know, and I got past the tower and I I buried it, you know, and every chance I got, I put a little sharpen on it, you know, because I was going to kill this dude. It took the only other black guy that was on death row in 1982 to stop me from killing my neighbor, you know, because it's on the news. We're watching this dude, you know, Reno News, how he did this girl. And now he's on death row with us, you know. Right. I mean, he got sentenced. They gave him the death penalty. And you're not gonna live next to me. But it took the only other guy that was on death row, older guy, much older than me, you know. And I, we, we sort of knew each other from the the county jail, you know. We, he was a badass. Nobody messed with this dude. So, uh, when he saw that I got the death penalty, yeah, youngster, I remember you. But I told him, I said, yeah, I'm gonna knock this dude off. I'm gonna do everybody a favor. He said, well. If you do that, then you might as well go on in that chamber over there, you know. And he said, you may not, he may kill you. You underestimating him because he's this little skinny, scrawny guy? He's on death row with you. What makes you better than him? The same society that said kill him said kill you. And man, that sent, man, that woke me up. And believe it or not, Steve-O, I spoke to the guy, you know. Didn't want to know him, and I, but every day I would, hey, man. you know. Did you tell him you just, were thinking about killing him? No. Okay. He saw it in my eyes. <laughs> He's, I mean, he. I think he literally told the officer, I never want to be out with this guy. Okay. You know, I'm the youngster. And right. the only other youngster up there, they're up there for killing um, uh, a detective up in Reno. That know? makes them like uh, royalty oh, in prison. They got taken care of. Yeah. I mean, the, the Aryan Brotherhood. Man, I, I smoke weed, I, whatever I wanted, you know. That's, the, took, that, that's and, what I want to talk about, And the too. officers, you know, the officers that was on CMU, Condemned Man Unit, that was up in Carson City. 
uh, that's death row. That's death row. And they understood. Most of them guys are dead. I don't think one of them is living because they were older guys, seasoned officers. They knew how to talk to you. They, you know, the guy bring you a pie and say, hey, James, my wife baked this. Wow. Eat the whole pie, James. You know, some fish. I, we went and caught some, you know, some bass, James, and my wife cooked it up. Eat, you know, because we was there. You know, we didn't go outside. We were on top of the fourth. We were on top of the sale house, you know. And one of the greatest moments, I got to get this in, Tom Selleck did a movie on the yard, uh, An Innocent Man. And before he left, he asked, where's Death Row? And he turned around and pointed at Death Row. If I ever get a chance to talk to Tom Selleck, I'll say, you pointed at me, dude. Wow. And I say, those dudes that, that's in the movie, those are my homeboys, Train and all them, night, them dudes used playing basketball, they're my homeboys. Wow, so, so they really, they, they, those were not actors? No, no, those were convicts. That's incredible. Yeah, but Tom Selleck, he, he. I mean, if you ever watched that movie, man, he was he just fell in place, right? And you know, I might have to watch that. And movie. so <laughs> when I went back and I did a little tour of the prison, you know, after almost forty years, uh, it just a lot of memories came back, you know. But he donated a lot of uh, weights and stuff like that to the yard, and he looked out for the yard, Tom Selleck. Man, that's cool. You said that when you were in death row, that you were watching the news with your neighbor on death row, so you're, you're seeing about his case and yes. that's why you mm -hmm. arrived at the conclusion that you needed to, to take care of him. Oh, yeah. um, to me, it's fascinating. I wasn't the only one now. Right. There's other guys that had that same thought. Right. To me, it's fascinating that you're on death row watching TV. Yeah. Like, where, where's the TV located? Uh, your family was allowed to send you a package every six months and they send you a stereo TV back then you can man I, I, I can have a 50 inch TV wow I, mean, I remember <laughs> the, death row I mean you know and, I mean they're gonna take it apart and you, yeah. I remember the Eddie Murphy movie yeah. uh, 48 hours with Nick Nolte and, and he had a TV in his yeah, cell yeah, yeah so yeah so you got a TV in your cell mm -hmm. on death row mm -hmm. um, and it can you get can you get a cable subscription or watch MTV and HBO well, and the the the, um, the prison had a cable system that they had to deal with, and um, every cell, you know, they was paying um, like so much for so many cells. So we got the basic cable, you know, a so, sports channel. So you got ESPN, Skinamax. <laughs> You get yeah. Skinamax? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what we yeah. So, 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 so you never miss uh, the Super Bowl? No. You, you get all the regular channels. You got ESPN, yeah. you got MTV. Mm -hmm. they, knew, they knew what it what it took to keep a maximum, you know, prison or institution calm. Right. When you, when you let uh, inmates and convicts watch TV, and have another escape, yeah, your yard is gonna go pretty well. Uh, okay. You know? And like I said, they gave me a huge outlet because once the count was clear, you know, this way out the death row, but I'm going straight to the band room, you know? Right. Yeah, I'm going straight to the gym, to the band room. and. Uh, How much time in death row is spent um, in your cell? It depends on your level of uh, classification. You right. know, if you're being good and you're not being a problem and you're not receiving receiving like uh, notice of charges, discipline, you know, you have to go in front of a discipline committee. Um, you can spend up to almost 12, 13 hours out yourself. And that uh, 12, 13 hours is in like a communal. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can pick another guy to come out and you can play cards. And normally uh, me and the other black guy that was on death, he'd come out and. And he made Porter, because he, he went up another level, so he was able to go everywhere, you know. Okay. Go get the food and, you know, not outside, but they'd bring it to the big door, and he was able to grab it and bring up the child and stuff. What about drugs on death yeah, row? Yeah, that's my next question. Are you smoking weed on yeah, death row? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to roll a, a pinhead no bigger than a match, you know, a match okay. stick, you know, and so Pinner. you're rolling. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and so... Um, we had one officer even gave us the um, the tip on how to get rid of the smell. He said, "Listen, guys, I ain't looking for nothing, but I have a nose." 
<laughs> right. So you take so, the toilet roll, you put the balance yeah. sheet in it, and yeah, you go I mean, through that, there? That's, no, that's the old, that's that's county jail. That's, okay. That's rookie stuff. Okay. No. <laughs> that's, that's as high as Steve got. <laughs> <laughs> Candidly, I didn't even learn that trick in jail. I uh, learned that in college dorms, which is amazing because it's just about the only thing I learned in college. But... I digress. Since college, I've learned something way more important, which is that blue chew tablets make sex a lot more fun. Why? Because they contain the same active ingredient as Viagra and Cialis, but they only cost a fraction of the price. That's right. I'm talking about blue chew tablets. And man, they're more delicious now. There's like a new flavor or something. That, dude, I love the way they taste. And I love that when I chew them up and then I go show my girl my blue tongue, she screams ah, and hugs me and she knows I'm going to take her to Bone Town. That's right. The Bone Yard because Blue Chew tablets give me a major boner. Ah, oh, man. So much fun. If you're really still wondering, are Blue Chew tablets fun? I can assure you they are. Plus, you could get an entire month's supply of Blue Chew tablets completely for free. All you got to pay is five bucks for shipping if you go to bluechew.com and use the promo code STEVO. That's right. Plus, the prescription, you consult with an online provider, a medical provider online at bluechew.com. You take care of that quickly and easy. And again, an entire month's supply of Blue Chew tablets is on its way to your house and you are having a good old time. All you gotta pay is five bucks for shipping. So jump on this deal, go to bluechew.com, use the promo code Stevo, and let's get back to it. Uh, but on death row, we were allowed to have like uh, skillets and, and hot plates and things like that, right? Because, you know, it was like a privilege. The warden right. say, as long as you guys, like. That's their incentive to keep everything running keep smooth. It, exactly, and so, uh, we had a guy, I just call him by the name of Moose, old biker, and he's on death row, and he would love to get up and cook eggs, and uh, short line was a bunch of all, uh, uh, lifers, and they had a garden, so they would send up fresh stuff to the to death row. What's know? short line? Short line are uh, lifers who are never getting out, but they have a trade, and they they giving back some type of way. Uh, the license plate factory. Yep. You know, uh, maintenance, the old boiler room. Those are lifers that live in there, and that's a, that's like a privilege to live in the boiler room. You got this big old room, and you don't have no body, no no officer breathing down you. You got a, a courtyard you can come out to. You just taking care of the boiler room, make sure you know, and so I never made short line because of the death row status. Once I got off of death row, but. Um, they looked out for death row and sent us fresh uh, garden and fruits and vegetables up there. And, and he would cook. And we, <laughs> you know, and some of the harder drugs, too. You know, I wouldn't, you know. But the tip to getting rid of the smell, the officer would bring us popcorn. And you just simply burn that bag of popcorn till you can't burn it no more. You put it on high. And they, what the hell? It, it's, you, you ever smell burnt popcorn? Sure. It's good. You ain't gonna smell no weed. Okay. So, so, and you know, we were getting weed like from Humboldt County up in Winnemucca. This is the great grade of weed coming down from. Yeah. Know. So, the white guys, they, you know, they really looked out, man. And the brotherhood was one thing. You know, as long as the drug flow was cool, everybody's cool. And that, that's from death row to the general population. That's in every prison across America. As long as that drug flow is cool, there's no racial tensions, there's no you know, uprising against the administration. Everybody's, you know, self-medicated, doing their own, doing their time. Right. How about alcohol? Are you are you making your own alcohol on death row? Well, Pruno. That's still rookie stuff. Oh, uh, okay. You know, veterans, you drinking alcohol. You're you bringing drinking in, vodka. You're, you're bringing in Seagram's. As long as they're, as, as long <laughs> yeah. as they're a free staff, and what I mean by a free staff, a free citizen, whether it's a nurse, a storekeeper, a bookkeeper, that's other, that anything other than an officer that's been sworn by, you know, they're, they're going to bring in, they can be compromised. Okay, I mean, and, even officers, I got to believe, oh, yeah. are going to participate too. Sure. You know, once you have a family member, you can be a 20-year-old cop, you know, and, and, and decorated. Once you have a family member, 
that went through the justice system and you love that family member, your heart turns a little bit. Right. And if you, I've seen so many correction officers, more men than women often, to, you know, dude, I understand, man. I was this far from being here. Right. You know, what you need, man? You good? You know? Right. And, you know, and you learn to respect, okay, this guy's just trying to go home. He could have been here, but he chose this life, and then he offered me something, you know? He's, he's coming, you know, with a gift. Like, dude, I'm not just talking. Uh, I know you got life. You're in a shoe program. You know, no one may ever untie that shoe, you know? And that's just the lingo for being locked away. In, right. You know. What a shoe means, what's it stand well, for? if you put like your shoe on, yeah, if, if his shoe is on, that shoe is going to stay on until what? To take it off. Mm. So if you put a man in a cell and you lock that door, he's in there. That's a shoe program. That's like okay. 23 hours a day? That's right. So so when you got off death row, were you in the shoe? I was in uh, intensive, um, what was they calling it? Uh, intensive group where you they modified you, you had to check in. You know, because I was different, so they had to check my my psych, you know, being on death row and being young. So they really monitored me. I had to go and see the psychologist um, once a week. We'd sit there, and she and I would talk the same thing. Yeah. What do you think about life, James? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm alive. That's what I think about life, you know. Yeah. I live the rest of my life, you know, in here. She said, that may just happen, but what if you're free one day? You know. And she's dead now too, but wow, all those old people. But anyway, that was a normal day, you know, just being um, being locked away, man. And I tell you what, um, until a man is faced with being, you have to live with another person that you don't know. This is a stranger. He just moved in. He's a lifer like you, and. Is he strong like me? Is you know you don't know this person, and so and the worst thing that the prison system did to me, when they allowed the race, you can't mix races. They should have never done that. When did they do that? In this state, I think it was eighty six. They started pushing the classification changed, and in prison, you know the only people that can live together. If you come in and say, you know, uh, you're gay and you'd rather live with a gay person, blah, blah, blah. But just uh, me and you bunking up as cellies? No, the administration, oh, no. Because no, they know that as soon as the drugs get low or as soon as somebody get hit that shouldn't have got hit, you know, a stabbing or something went on, uh, the forces that be are going to change. And uh, you can't live with that black guy anymore. You're either a soldier, you're either with us or you're not. And the same with the blacks. You can't live with that white guy. Why are you living with him? And the guy go, right. we went to school together. Our families know each other. I'm from the same neighborhood with this guy. We don't care. Yeah. Um, this is the code and you're gonna live by it. Could I ask, uh, what was your last meal gonna be? <laughs> uh, sorry. Well, just... uh, you know what? Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because they played a trick on me when I got there. Two of the officer, old Silver Fox, and um, oh, uh, Woodman came and got me and they said, youngster, we just got a call from the courts. We're gonna have to prepare, prepare you in the overnight cell. You know? Meaning and that now, now you're everybody's not gonna walk quiet. Meaning your time's up. Yeah, everybody's quiet on the road. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the, you know, for Killer, the black guy to go, you know, give me a sign or something, what, you know? And he's not up, he's not up at, at, at his bars looking at me and you know, he's, so they get me and they take me over and the priest come up, Father Dave, good guy. I forgave him. He's part of the, he's, well, Mr. Allen, um, we know that you're a Christian. He's reading from it and, you know, you was raised a Christian, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to say a prayer and everything? And I'm looking at, are you, this, this real? You know, I mean, I'm right across from the chamber. In the, you know, they got two cells. You got the overnight cells, then you got the chamber. And I'm looking. Are they serious? So they left me in there till like one o'clock in the morning that night. You know, they came and got me like five that afternoon. You know, like one o'clock. And uh, Silver Fox go, "Come on out, youngster. 
we just wanted to see your manhood. We want to see if you, you know, if you pumping that, that real blood or when you gonna break down. And I'm, you know, and so Killer comes out and he really embraced me. He said, man, don't think nothing of that. You know, we got the other youngsters when they came up here, the ones that knocked off the uh, the detective. You passed the test. Yeah, you passed the test. So, you know, don't think, no, but I had to tell my mom and she was furious. They did uh, what? And she, uh, she raised, she called the lieutenant. She had a way of reaching and getting hold of people, you know, and wow. next thing you know, here come these wardens and, you know, you okay, youngster? You all right? You know, and they have me talk to the psychologist, and you know, I'm good. Yeah. That's some like fraternity hazing. Yeah, so I had to put that in the book, man. I, and I forgave those officers because it shook me, but it, you know, it, it something deep down it said, no, it ain't happening like this. Mr. Criminal didn't say it's gonna happen like this. I, you know, I got a stay of execution, and I got. So I started thinking, you know. Right. When you got from off death row into regular prison mm -hmm. did you miss death row at all sure you know i i developed some good friendship in there you know it's some guys uh they still on the row after all these years and i would love to see them make it off and just live a life you know um um tom wilson he's the longest one up there now you know i like to see tom and you know and uh Murder is murder, man. Uh, you know, there's uh, to me, there's there's no way to really define, uh, you know, a killing. If it's an if it's an intent, you know, you have said and you contemplated killing somebody and you mapped out how it's gonna go. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't deserve this this type of life. This this life now is fun, man. You know, uh, when I made it home. And I, you know, I used to sit back and go, wow, this is what I was in a hurry to come back to? You know, because I'm watching the news and you're watching all this bad stuff and you're watching, and I'm going, wow, man. But in my life, I have to calculate my life and where I'm at with my family and my loved ones and the circle that, you know, and, and it's okay. I'm in a, I'm in a good place. Um, you know, I have a Bible and it's in my truck right now. There's a picture of my victim in the back of my Bible. So every morning when I say a prayer, I say a prayer for Mr. Sylvester too. You know, he was a good dude, man. You know, I, I learned a little about my victim and, you know, nice home and he's, you know, he had a fiance, he was getting ready to get married. <laughs> you know, uh, what I say, if he had the t chance to say something today, I think he probably would say, give Mr. Allen a chance. You know, cause I have a good heart and I made, some good, good conscious changes about me. I did some soul searching, man. And one did of you things, ever reach out to his family after you got free? Well, no. That was one of the clauses of okay. my parole. Do not try and contact because they knew me. The prison officials and the parole commissioners by now they know James Allen's gonna try and find out where his heart is. You know, I love everybody, and if I can help everybody, I want to. Right. Um, one of the things I want to do. Uh, the outgoing governor of this state, Governor Sisterlack, put a put a motion on the floor about a week ago to abolish the death penalty, and his constituents rose up against him. So I was there, and he came over and shook. This my is hand. a week ago, as in from today. Yeah, yeah. At the Supreme Court building, they hold the uh, they held the um, annual pardons board session. So with it being his last hearing, uh, he placed a motion on the floor to abolish the death penalty. But uh, I don't think that committee had that power. So many other things had to take place before. But I commend him for doing that. And in that, uh, I would love for this state to allow me to go and talk to those men and let them know, hey, you may not get the opportunity that I got, but if they abolish the death penalty and they give you life Man makes the best, make the best of it. Those guys of you, those guys of you that are on death row, you're smart, you're educators, you know, you were smart in, in growing up and things, because I know them, you know, they, I mean, it's some guys real quick. Come out and help these younger guys that's on the yard that will make parole. I would love to have that opportunity to talk to death row. You said that when you got off death row and in regular prison, 
that you missed the friendships that you had on death row. Yeah. But did you miss the the quality of life? Like, what was the quality of life in regular prison compared to to death row? This is something I really wanted to know about the quality of life in prison versus on death row. But first, let me tell you about the quality of life if you're in therapy or if you're not. Because this episode's brought to you by BetterHelp. And spoiler alert, quality of life is a lot better if you're in therapy. And actually speaking up about the things that are bothering you and figuring out ways to address them. And there's no better way to do that than with BetterHelp.com. That's Better, H-E-L-P dot com. And if you go to betterhelp.com slash Stevo, you get 10% off your first month. Now, a first month of what? It's therapy that teams you up with the ideal therapist for you based on what it is you want help with. And they've teamed up over 3 million people with therapists. And these sessions can happen online. You don't have to go driving around anywhere. It's super simple, super affordable. Plus, again, you get 10% off your first month if you go to betterhelp.com slash Devo. Again, my quality of life is a lot better because I use therapy to speak up about what's going on, about what's bothering me, and figuring out how to address it. So I urge you to increase your quality of life by going to betterhelp.com slash Devo. Now, let's compare death row to prison. Did you bring your television set from your oh, cell sure. and death yes. row? Same TV? Mm -hmm. And you got to mm -hmm. set up the same TV? And If I was smart, if I was a smart man, I would have took all of that stuff that my family sent to me on death row, boxed it up, and sent it home. <laughs> It'd be worth some money today. <laughs> wow. I would, but I got an ID card. I still have my okay. ID. So, so, so you take all of it, you, you take all the stuff in your death row cell, the TV, everything, everything and you move it right into your uh, to Next your cell. prison cell. Yeah. Is the prison cell the same size as the death no. row cell? Death row was plush. <laughs> Wow, that's what I mean, I'm trying to figure out. You know, I mean, a death row cell was like big as your, you know, your your RV here. Yes. You wow. Know, uh, yes. A and death, and you, yeah. got, you got one roommate in the death row cell? No, no by roommate. Yourself. By yourself. By, um, one thing about death row, you're not going to have a roommate. Okay. No, that that's one thing a state's not going to do. No so state in America house two guys together. So, so now you move into regular prison, you do have a roommate. Yes. And you're yeah. thinking, man, get me back on death row. This sucks. <laughs> well, you know, the first time I hit a medium yard, I thought I was literally on a college campus. These guys are wearing Jordash jeans. They're wearing silk shirts, long as blue. They're wearing low flow, you know, show loafers, and uh, they're wearing low quarter shoes and hats, and and they're headed to visiting. <clears throat> I'm going, they're going to visiting, like you know. And I got pictures of me on death row. You know, when I had my afro and my mom come up, you know, I got pictures. And so I'm used to just wearing jeans. I get there right. and I'm looking, you know, and I tell you, man, literally, I see these women and, you know, guys are coming up to me. They glass, they're hugging me, you know, James Allen, you, you off death row. We're glad. Blah, blah. So I see a, a flock of women over here. Right. And I'm looking. Women or, inmates or women visitors? I, I'm thinking these are women. These are not women. Oh, they're not. Oh, uh, gotcha. Uh, so they're inmates. <laughs> listen, dude. Booty shorts and I'm looking like. And 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 one guy go, no, th those are not women. So so, so there's a lot. Women, they're, 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 there's a lot more freedom of expression in prison yeah, compared to death row. Back then, right. back then. Now. Death Row, I, I think Death Row is just, they're just there, man. They're just sitting there. All of the programs have been stripped. Prison is nothing like it was. Am I, am I calling that ago. right? Prison versus, because Death Row is prison. Yes, it's all the same. None what? of it's the same. Okay, so so what what would I call it? You went from Death Row to General, general Population. population. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and in General Population, is there more or less drugs and alcohol? Oh, dude, 
man. There's way general more. General population. Huh? And see, I came, you know, my era was you can have currency on the yard. Dude, it was dudes rolling quarters and taping them up as long as this bar here, you know, and would go to the store with, you know, how many, however much that was, you know, you'd get a pen and write it on there. If that's 60 bucks, if that's, you it's know, like worth, about 60 bucks, worth, worth of quarters, you go to the store. And uh, the storekeeper, he look and, okay, he knows, you know. And I'm telling you, man, it was nothing to walk around with $1,000 of uh, paper money. That was illegal. You only can have the quarters, you know, you could only can have, uh, you know, in currency, but you couldn't have paper dollars. And man, it but was. But people had it anyway. Poker game, big time poker games. Guys betting two and three hundred dollars. Wow. Poker. Yeah. So was, some more money, more drugs, more yeah. alcohol in mm -hmm. general population. And guess what? This was doing the with the Democrats in charge and the Republicans. It didn't matter, you know. Prison had a standard where it took care of itself. You know, there was prison jobs, there was prison furloughs. So in the 80s and the 90s, you know, if you had to do some time, you can work. I mean, one of my first jobs, I was making minimum wage. I was working for um, Imperial Palace, uh, classic car collection. They would bring out one car and we would strip it down and they was paying us minimum wage. I was sending home literally six to seven hundred dollars a month and that was huge. Sending it to your mom? Yeah, you know, to you take care of my kids. kids. Yeah, I had my, my son, when I got arrested, my son was one years old and my daughter just turned, uh, she was like five months. Wow, okay. So they grew up, I got a picture of me and my son and my daughter uh, standing in the visiting room and like I said, my son came and you know, that was an experience there, man, uh, I tell you. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of your story is that you're in general population, yeah. your son's 15 years old, mm -hmm. and you're sharing a cell in yeah. prison with your son. Yeah, unfortunately, he, he was part of a program where uh, they was targeting young youth who were at risk. And my son had a fascination of guns, too. So what he, he takes the handle the butt of a 32 and he's got it sitting in his locker so when kids see it all they seeing is the handle you know the butt of the gun right mm -hmm. right so the judge figured well <clears throat> we're gonna put you on this 90-day uh, program we're gonna you're gonna go out to the prison and you're gonna be around convicts convicted felons and they're gonna mentor you. You're gonna be there for 90 days. It's like a serious, yeah. high-level, scared straight program. Yes. And so I really wasn't in contact with his mom at the time, that side of the family. So this is how it snuck up on me. But guy came to the, the band room one day and he goes, hey, it's a kid down in intake saying he's your kid. Saying he's my kid? So I uh, summoned the warden and I go, I need to go to intake. I need to go down there, Warden. And, you know, the Warden had a lot of trust in me by this time. I could pretty much move around the institution. So I go down, and I look at this kid, and it's my kid. I go, what are you doing? And he goes, Pops, I'm, I'm here for 90 days. So that next morning, I went to the, the Warden's office. I said, you have to move. I know it's against the, I know I, I'm working the program because I had several youngsters before. And... He goes, you know we can't do that, Alan. I go, please put him in the room with me. He needs to learn something. I may not ever get a chance to be a father. Wow. I may not ever get a chance to teach him wow. nothing, man. And I'm telling the warden goes, he made me sign the agreement and my son had to sign it and the waivers and we moved my son in. And uh, this kid, man, he really didn't know nothing. He didn't know how to brush his teeth. He didn't know how to shower and keep his hygiene up. And one of the most, uh, dramatic and profound moments of my incarceration was the night they came and told him and I to step out the room and strip down. And I'm standing there naked in front of my son. Wow. And he's naked. And I go, this is what you want? This is what you want? Take a take a lesson, you know. Why'd I they said, do that? Because they, you know, it, when they're doing a, a strip search, you know, they can pick any cell and go to any unit. And it can be um, just random, but uh, I think they was, you know, I had I had a couple run-ins with a couple officers, and I think they was trying to get back and embarrass me in front of my my kid. So, 
And we're standing there, and they didn't, you know, after they tore up the cell and went through everything, and we went back in. And I go, well, get dressed, and now let's put the cell back like it's supposed to look, real comfortable. And, and let's watch some TV. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Let's get back to the football game. You know? Yeah. So, but, you know, it was a pleasure, man, being a dad. And my son, even though he didn't learn from that lesson, my son did 25 years in Arizona. Ah. And he's been recently released. He's doing well. He's a manager uh, uh, for some phone company, some type of, uh, what do they call them? Uh, Cell phone? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you talk uh, telemarketing. Type okay, of gotcha. Thing. But anyway, he's doing well, and he got married, and uh, he wrote a little book, a little memoir book you know, about being in prison and being around his dad. Uh, he's not talented, but he can play drums. He can't sing or anything. You know, I can sing and play just about every instrument. So. Um, I'm really interested by how you said they, they you got people to send a piano yeah. into a prison. Keyboards, all kind of synthesizers, man. So now Some of the stuff we had to fix, and we were allowed to go in the maintenance shop and use soldering guns, and you know, we had to take some of the resistors and tweak with them, and, you know, get some of the old tube amps <laughs> and recharge them. But, um and uh, the the piano is not going to live in your cell next to your 50 inch TV it's going to go to uh, the band room yes but there was no band room before you and guys were allowed I mean it depends on like I said your classification the level that in what prison yard you're on and some guys were allowed to have a guitar in their cell um, a small keyboard um, you know um, and you, of course you had to have headphones you know, a little mini amp, you know, as time, you know, went by and technology, yeah, but. And you had all the same TV channels in general population as you did on death row. Yes, same, everybody. No, no more, no less. No more, no less. And. Well, on death row, if there's certain uh, programming that they didn't want us to watch, like uh, little kid stuff, yeah, they, okay. would, block, they would block it out. Okay. Uh, um, Serial killers type, you know, you you weren't gonna watch. Did you ever killers. see the the show on A and E called The First Forty Eight? Yes, or, that show's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I love mm -hmm. that show. Mm -hmm. So so you're able to watch that in jail. Mm -hmm. When 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 uh, when the when our Jackass movie came out, did you see that in jail? You know, um, I heard of it, and I don't know. I it, it, it was something that someone was saying that. It's a bunch of guys and they're, they're playing grab ass and they're, they're so doing so all kinds of things. So you couldn't watch it, but you said that yeah. doesn't sound so, like my thing. Right. But, <laughs> but I tell you, the first episode that I really watched was uh, Jackass Forever. Okay. And oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that wow. was even more grab ass than <laughs> usual. <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm watching the dragon and I had no clue what the dragon was and my brother's sitting there watching it with me <laughs> the dragon oh, no. <laughs> the audience is thick. going through the town yeah they didn't yeah. know it yeah wow. they made, damn they got I, me I you, other than you my my other favorite is the uh, we man yeah we man he's great wow man. right I, you know and i'm telling my you know a couple people they know about you guys and they're going man dude you're gonna be with steve O and <laughs> <laughs> and I go, well, you know, they found out about the story and, you know. Uh, I mean, it's a hell of a story, man. Yeah. It's a hell of a story. When, and, I'm, and I'm really just, I'm fascinated by the, the, the whole just idea of, of prison and what, it, what it's like. It's really interesting to hear you describe it. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like you're describing uh, a quality of life which, you know, I'm not going to say that being in prison doesn't sound so bad, but at the same time, you got you got a life in there. Mm -hmm. You got a life in prison, and it, it helps me understand. Just drove and yeah. some of the things I was telling you. It helps me to understand why people would would really want to take death penalty off the table, because in prison, it's not great to be in prison, but. You got a life in there. Yes. I tell you what, Steve, uh, I told you at the beginning, I felt like I was a, a guinea pig or part of a test uh, type of uh, program, you know, where people wanted me to fail out here. I couldn't adapt. 
uh, I was so far behind time and being on death row reality. And there's there's a lot of pressure on me to always um, go beyond, you know. Um, I don't want to be out here and be um, stuck, as they say. You know, I want to learn just as fast as the next guy. I want to, you know, I want to be competing just like the next guy. I want to be right there and uh, help my family and um, be a servant. That's what I am. I'm a servant now. You know, they gave me time to serve, and by all means, I guess uh, the time served itself and all is forgiven and now I'm a servant out here. I'm always been a servant, even after death row. You know, I don't think no one has this story in nowhere in the world um, and that have done the things that I have been allowed to do. And I'm very, very appreciative and I'm very remorseful that a person lost their life behind my ignorance and my silliness. Did I deserve a death penalty? No. And I'll tell you why. But I deserved a punishment. I deserved a lifetime punishment to serve. You know, I have to give back. And a lot of doors are closed. A lot of doors are not being opened because people know it's a fascinating story. And I think this is the first time that it's actually probably on a national level, you know, with you guys. Everything's always been local. It's like they want to keep it. And right. it's not going to stay that way. Not with you know i mean i'm i'm just now understanding this right you know i mean this 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 was a monster to me i bet you know what what <laughs> when you were in prison did you watch the movie the green mile yes so yeah. that now did you watch that in your cell yes so that means you had vcr or a dvd player in but your cell I, too yeah well what they would do is uh every week a unit would be graded on cleanliness, uh, how well you behave, and they, they would bring in a movie. And okay. you, you can pick the movie. They would bring out a list. And uh, during that time, Green Mile was at the top of the boxing. Yeah. I mean, we won't see Green Mile. It's a good movie. Oh, a great, great movie. movie. And, and, and when Shawshank you, Redemption yeah. is my best. Oh, Shawshank Redemption is maybe the other one I was one. thinking of. Um, <laughs> Love Shawshank yeah. Redemption. Yeah. When when, uh, when you asked, Vinny over here asked you if you had trouble acclimating to freedom, because of technology I was thinking forget about the technology what about work what about what well, just being institutionalized there's that guy in the For Shawshank sure, Redemption yeah. who's just too institutionalized he wanted to go could, back in couldn't mm -hmm. deal with it yeah. he killed yes. himself because mm -hmm. he couldn't deal with it yeah did you relate with that guy on any level well you know I understood what he went through because when you're back in those days in that type of structure and, yeah. and and the way they was portraying that sale house Brooks a dungeon yes yeah. Brooks you know that's all he had and he'd befriend a bird yeah if, you know reality's gone if you gonna talk to <laughs> <laughs> right it's gone so right. <laughs> here I know guys personally they can adapt and they've only done like maybe 10 15 years and they're right. out here struggling and they go, how do you do it, Mr. Allen? You know, and I go, and that's that's every race, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I'm that's I'm, just humanity. I am president of the Lifers Group, which uh, the former director, first woman director of the state of Nevada, she allowed us to form that group, and they respect it. It's on the books today, the Lifers Group, and so I've been trying to the Lifers that are out here on parole, and they're on lifetime parole like me but they have businesses, they're upstanding citizens. Right. Their neighbors ne don't never knew that this guy, I've been eating at this guy's restaurant and he's an ex-felon and he did 20 years, but these are the type of guys that I'm telling, get out here, let the people know that you're out here, you know? Right. Now, yeah. was it difficult for you finding paying work? Right. Hmm. Um, when you gotta fill out that I'm yeah. a felon. Well, I'll tell you what, when I, my first job was at a place called Anderson Dairy, and I was uh, loading trucks at night, you know, milk and dairy, coal as hell. And I they had a crew, I was with a crew of, of uh, Mexicans, and none of them spoke English, and you know, but it showed me something different, that in prison, you can't break bread together. 
But out here, these guys can barely, they, you know, they just knew I was a crew member. They didn't care if I was an ex-felon, you know, and they, they gave me a burrito like at lunchtime, you know. But the job was very easy to get uh, because I would go in and I'll tell them, hey, I'm fresh out of prison, you know. Can I work here? Do you guys hire ex-felons? Uh, I'm just telling you up front. And they go fill out the application. So that was a sign right there. Right. Like it's a case by case. For right. sure. Yes. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, and right today, um, you know, I have like a sciatic arthritis coming on or something, but I get that pinched nerve, so ah. I can't do a lot of physical work. But, and I don't like um, a lot of, I don't know, soft work. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a man and I've worked with my hands and I've, you know. Um, don't you make a living? In, with your band? Well, you know, I'm trying to get a residency here. Um, and I'm grateful that, you know, uh, places like the Sand Dollar, um, I have did corporate gigs out on the strip, I, you know, uh, some of the strip uh, hotels, but they not a residency, you know, and right. I don't know if it's because of the ex-felon, but I, I'm a business, <laughs> I have a business license and I'm insured, I'm bun but the band is, and we're a pretty good band. What's but the band name? It's James Allen and Unique Minds. James Allen and Unique Minds. Unique Minds. Are you just vocals or do you play an instrument too? Well, uh, in this band, I'm doing most of the uh, lead singing and percussions. Okay. And are, are, uh, is your music available to people to find on? Well, what we do, yeah, we're on YouTube and uh, we do a lot of uh, cover tunes. Okay. So, you know, we want you dancing in the lounge and in the, but um, I'm really trying to get the band somewhere and so it's a little, because, you know, if I'm allowed to go on the road and tell my story, I would like to bring my band along. Sure. I wouldn't like for a producer or a director to go, well, we hear that uh, you're a singer. Uh, will you do a song for us? And I'm, you know, we'll put some musicians around you, whatever. I got a band. You know? Right. <laughs> were you able to record music while you were in prison? No. No, no recording. recording device. Okay. And if we, one time we tried and, and they go, and they found it. Right. And we had it going through one of the Yamaha system, through the PA system. And, you know, we had a little, you know, the, little, the old little box tape re, uh, uh, cassette recorder. Yeah. You know, you can hit play and you record it. So we had it patched in and they found out about it. So we had All to. Right. We Did had you get. To, uh, Tangled up in in a, in a, in gate like you, you kind of have to be in a gang in prison, right? Oh, you know what? Let me take that back. At the end, right before I paroled, we did record. Cool. I did record with that band, so they do have that. Okay. All right. What was yours? Um, I mean, I, we could probably talk forever about, but 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 in, in prison, you kind of have to be in a gang. Is that right? Oh, you have to show your type of uh, allegiance, you know, you affiliate or you associate it. You know, I never uh, took on the tag of uh, me being initiated in. I'm too strong right. for that. I'm a leader, you know. Good. Um, but my association was through um, just friendship, you know, giving them, you know, because I helped every gang. Once, uh, if you came out of crib, out of the fish tank intake, you know, and I, you know, your 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 file is gonna tell me what you are because you're coming from the county jail, so you're already tagged, and I know what you are. And I, you know, some of my spills doing um, um, my intake uh, portion of orientation, I would tell the guys, if you come in here because your homeboy's on the yard, you made a mistake, because your homeboy is nothing, because if he was. He'd be here talking to you instead of me. So I would get their attention right away, you know, and I would let them know the chapel is off limits. You, you don't go up there sagging your pants. You don't go up there repping your gang. You don't go up there beefing with no one. You know, the chapel is a sacred place. Uh, Native American, um, their uh, lodges and stuff, their, 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 their space, all that is sacred ground. So all that stuff had to be told to these youngsters coming in because they was coming in by the boatload and I mean every nationality you know so what I'm hearing is that you were diffusing oh, a lot yeah yeah and and, and did you find yourself <clears throat> like pressured into like situations that you couldn't control which required you to 
put people in check to oh, participate in violence. I tell you what, dude. Sometimes you know what? Um, when you, when a convict knows that there's a a window, or there's a little light at the end of the tunnel, man, he does a lot of soul searching. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of fights and a lot of violence that I had to walk away from. You know, and. When you got a guy calling you, you know, another guy that thinks he's just tough or he's trying to get a rep, you know, hey, I knocked off James Allen or I did this to James Allen and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you have to, you have to put yourself almost in a, in an acting position. Like, I'm ready at all times. I may not look ready, but yeah. I'm ready at all times. And if you bring it, I'm going to bring it. So, and that's how you have to carry yourself in there, man. Um, you can't show no sign of weakness. If you show a sign of weakness, they're going to tell. They may not get you, but it's going to go down the pipe. Yeah. Got one coming your way. Yeah. Man, you know, for all my tough talk and I'm crazy and I do stunts, man, I, I would not do well in there. I tell you what, uh, one of the scariest moments was a black kid got killed. And he was from a rival gang. So all the OGs got together. And this is black and white. A uh, white guy killed a black guy over a poker game. The black guy jumped on the white guy, gave him a black eye. The white guy sitting there at the, the next morning at the breakfast table with a huge signer. So his, his homeboys, what the hell happened to you? Oh, he whooped your, you know. So now they're edging it on. Oh, no, you got to go back. You got to retaliate. So now one of the most scariest things is that you don't know when it's going to jump off. So now you have to start preparing yourself. Dude, I, we had to literally go in the law library. And you can check out four books at a time. These big law, you know, law books with the hard back binder. And I mean, literally, you have to line your jacket. Oh, wow. That ain't, wow. That, that ain't nothing on the movie. That's real. And I can literally, go, you, we had to go up at Old Max. You had to go down these steps and go through this tunnel, you know, to get to the chow hall, to get to the kitchen. And... At the end of the tunnel, there's an officer with a spray gun. You do any type of <laughs> wrongdoing down this tunnel, he's going to start spraying. He don't care what he hit. Like a fire hose? Yes. No. Bullets. Oh, spray gun. So yes. you say spray gun. And back gun. then it was buckshots. Man, I, look. I that, got that dude would start spraying. Somebody would get into a fight in that, in that tunnel, and he'll start spraying them buckshots. Pow, pow, and you can literally hear him. Just, you can feel him hitting your ankle. You know, we're trying to dive and get run for cover, but I can literally feel, and, and you snubbed up against, you know, every race. It ain't the blacks over here going through the tunnel. Everybody has to go through the tunnel at one time. And you can feel somebody trying to hit you, dude. And wow. I, I got, yeah, I got a scrape right here. Got past the book. And you don't know who hit you. You're looking around and, you know, you're ready to get into it. But if you start to fight, you're going to get shot too. Because you're going through this tunnel and you're, you know, and I'm telling you, that is serious. You know, stuff like that I wanted to put in the book because it's real. But, uh, you know, it's just so many uh, prison stories, man. Uh, you know, when you sitting in the child hall and you watch a guy get hit in the neck and hear his blood just skeeting out. And, you know, you up under the table trying to keep from getting shot. And, and see, granted, Steve, when I came off of death, they still had metal trays. You got a metal fork and a tray with a metal cup. And I've seen dudes get whooped so bad in that kitchen with the metal. This is a weapon, man. A fork in the neck will do it. These trays, I mean, you can hit that. It ain't going to bend. It's a tray. You know, county jail. Yeah, they, I mean, weapons, man. I'm sorry. Man. Weapons. It, I mean, it's nothing that I gloat about because I, 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 uh, I welcome that experience, but I don't enjoy how it came about. Because sure. a person lost their life. Um, but the experience, man. Um, I mean, you've lived, you've lived it all, man. Yeah. To be 63 uh, and, and it's to still be around, I know a lot of guys, they're gone. That I did time, that did 20 years, make it home, and then die out here. Like they couldn't get with this. They couldn't. They couldn't gravitate to the, you know, okay, we're not in prison anymore. It's real. Right. You know, that James that you knew in prison, totally different out here. See, right. 
you know, because you don't really know me. You met me in prison. Yeah, we walked in yards, we talked stories, we broke bread, but now I'm free, see? And so I don't know Steve-O the killer, you know, do he really like me, you know? Then I have to go back, uh, what type of case did he have? How did he get that murder, you know? Because you don't know who you're dealing with. You're right. rubbing elbows, you're out here kicking it with them. You know, like I said, I'm out here with lifers and stuff. So this is why I had to form the lifers group out here. So we can continue to stay in touch with each other and see where we're at. You know, a lot of them done died off, I tell you, man. Uh, and dope. That, that, hitting that dope. Yeah. That, you know, they, they couldn't wait to get out and get to that, that real dope. Man. So it's safe to say that you very much value your freedom. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, I, I think I'm going to live past 100, man. God, <laughs> God's going to punish me. You're going to see this. All right. You're going to see this uh, to the end. And it's just something he wants me to see. And, you know, I'm not a big Bible thumping type of guy. Uh, I do believe in Christianity and I do believe that God shined on me. Right. That for whatever reason, he gave me this because uh, technically uh, the jury spoke and the governor spoke. You know, right. Gave you life. I you took you from death row to life and now parole. See, so it's something in the cards. I just, you know, right. I'm still trying to figure it out. And you're out here giving back, going to talk to people to, to help them have better lives. Yes. And doing the right thing, mm -hmm. not breaking the laws, not doing it, being a good guy. Yes, sir. All um, right. You know, um, I wanted you to. I wanted to show you a little piece of the band. Uh, All right. Can you hold up your book for the camera so everybody can see and just give it a plug? Sure. Yeah. And they can get it on Amazon, right? Yes. Yes. And she's a great author, and we co-wrote the book together. Uh, you know, she, uh, I wasn't the first guy that she wrote about. The first guy that she wrote about was this Cuban that was on death row with me. And uh, he was convicted wrongly. He was the only guy I can actually say that didn't do the, that didn't do the murder. Did you ever say you were innocent when you were in prison? No. No. And that's rare? Yeah, no. No, I'm guilty. Yeah, but isn't prison just full of guys saying they didn't do it? Yes, all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all the time. I mean, you know, um, that's a standard. Uh, and then, literally, you get guys, their first night in the fish tank, crying for their moms and boo-hooing. Yeah. Like, how did I do this? How did I get it? You know, and these, and these guys come from a good home, good upbringing, and, you know, mom and dad there, and, you know, schooling and everything, but... Somewhere along the way, you somewhere along the way you fell off, and you fell into this this this, this crime spree that's going on, and now you're part of the system, man. Right. Yeah. All yeah. right, yeah. man. Well, let, let let's let's see see the band thing. Yes. And uh, you know, Mike Tyson said this to me when I was on his podcast. He said we got millions of people watching right now. What, what do you want to say to them? And I like that. You got a message for everybody out there? Sure. Uh, yeah. See, that's what I'm saying, man. I've been dealing with this same phone all these years, and, and when you're trying to do something, it's like, okay, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> it, it's all good, man. Yeah. Um, there's a uh, assemblyman here. Um, I, I I like giving respect to the politicians that played a hand in my freedom. And one is uh, um, the former uh, assemblyman, uh, Harvey Mumford, who just had a name, uh, they just named a street in his honor on his, on his, where he lived, so that was, but uh, Lawrence Weekly, you know, uh, he was a former uh, county commissioner. Uh, Senator Harry Reid, you saw the picture? Yeah. Yep. And I think I'm the only, guy didn't come off of death row with Harry Reid with his arm around him. You know, they just named the airport after him, you know. All um, right. So, um, but my message is, is one that's, that's, um, that's real simple. You know, love life, live life, don't cheat life. 
All right. A message of gratitude, man. Thank you, James. Thank you, Steve-O, for having right. me. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I thought that was really cool, man. Thank you. Yeah, dude. How about that? I mean, we put up that no guest podcast, which probably some of you haven't seen because YouTube age restricted it. Sheesh. So click here if you're on YouTube to check that one out. That's where we came up with the idea to try to get a death row inmate to interview. And how about that? It took less than a week. So get uh, James Allen Jr.'s book in the uh, video description, right? Like uh, we, got, we linked that there. And thank you guys so much. I love you.